This is a story about a girl growing up in San Francisco in the 1930s. Her family suffers one tragedy after another, and she decides to escape the city and head to Yosemite. At Yosemite, she crosses paths with a real person in history, a park ranger. We're talking about the historical fiction, The View from Half Dome, with author Jill Cogarty on this Desideratum. Desideratum means something that is needed or wanted. But it's more than that, really. A desideratum is something essentially important. I'm audiobook narrator Teresa Bakken, and for me, story is an essential thing. That's why I hope when you listen to these conversations with authors and narrators, with scenes from their audiobooks, that you also hear something essential. I found a, an immense amount of information on Yosemite, the CCC at Yosemite, in the 30s. And so that became the basis for Isabel's brother, um, who works at the Cascades camp there. And then in doing that research, I came across Enid Michael, and I was just kind of astounded by all that I discovered about her. She's she was just an amazing woman, and I, I really couldn't resist. I had to weave her into the story. <laughs> this is author Jill Cogarty, talking about how the view from Half Dome's storyline and characters evolved. It always fascinates me how creators build one idea from another, or how one thing can lead them to another thing. I also really like how Jill explains how contrast was important to her storytelling. Well, first of all, the the coming of age part was very interesting to me because I wanted to kind of capture the pain of the depression and contrast that and the gritty city life in San Francisco at the time and just the, you know, the cold and the fog and people struggling in soup lines and trying to just make ends meet. I wanted to contrast that with Yosemite, which was kind of a haven for a lot of tourists at the time who they didn't have a lot of money to travel. So it, a lot of Californians in particular would go to the national parks and camp out. And I wanted to show the differences. That's why I wanted to highlight Isabel. Then I could fictionalize a lot more with Isabel, the protagonist, and then show her hypothetically meeting this woman, Enid Michael, at Yosemite, and while well, keeping true to the facts that I knew about Ian and Michael. Yeah, I love what you just said about it being a contrast, because that is what really struck me. I think an obvious contrast because of the nature and the beauty of it, but also you do this thing with how your protagonist interacts with Enid, and she has this lens and this experience of the city and people suffering, mm -hmm. and Enid does not have that frame of reference. Right. Yes. And that, that is something that I picked up from the writings of Eden Michael and some of the biographical information that I could, I could find on her. I, I inferred that she felt more comfortable around animals than people. And it, it, what struck me as very interesting was that while she loved the national parks, um, wanted to preserve Yosemite, that really was at the heart of her mission as a ranger naturalist. She used kind of anthropomorphic terms to name birds, flowers, plants, animals. And she really did have this feeding table that was in the back of the public wildflower garden at Yosemite. And she would leave food. And it struck me as, as interesting that this is the height of the depression. And there are probably just outside the park, there are people who are hungry but, you know, she was not necessarily tuned into the, those people so much. So, I, yes, Isabel brings that to her attention or is aware of this suffering from the city and, you know, also finds it a little strange that Enid is, is in her own bubble, <laughs> so to speak. But I think that that is a very timeless idea. We can be insulated from suffering that's happening very close to us. Yes. 
and that those things can be coexisting. You can have this idyllic birds eating off the picnic table at the same time that you have a woman with young children standing in a soup line. It's yes. And that these things do coexist. Yeah. Not just in 1934, California. Right. Agreed. And I would say that Enid Michael, to be fair, it was progressive for her time. I mean, she certainly, she would be considered an environmentalist, even a feminist, I would say today, in today's terms. Yes, I wasn't meaning that as a judgment on her. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. And I think you raise a really great point in that she had strengths of different kinds. And that is, it takes people with strengths of all different kinds to lift up and create a better community, yes, better society. And so Izzy brings something to it that Enid doesn't have. And Enid, she's forging a path for women. That's the other component that's happening in this story is that Enid is, did you say she was the first, right? Yes, at Yosemite, first female ranger naturalist. Yes, and that was not an easy path for her to take. And then no. there were also like barriers put up for her continuing in her role. Is all of that based on truth? That is, that is all factual. So one of the books that I have found that it contained Enid Michael's articles, some of them to Yosemite Nature Notes and Stockton, the Stockton Record, the editor had an intro, a brief introduction about her and it was pulled from the Yosemite National Park archives that she had to apply annually for her position as ranger naturalist. And she faced opposition from her direct supervisor, Bert Harwell, who, by the way, she had actually taught in the Yosemite School for Rangers a decade earlier. So it was a very odd kind of arrangement. Um, but he, he would come up with all kinds of excuses for why she shouldn't be reappointed, like sloppy appearance. She organized the wildflower garden in a way that he didn't agree with, or, you know, he would say that she, she needed to clock her time and she came and go, went as she pleased, uh, just, you know, one thing after another. Fortunately, the chief naturalist uh, supervisor disagreed and was able <laughs> and did reappoint her most summers, but it was a struggle for her every almost every year that she had to go through <laughs> this. That's so fascinating that you've found that, that that's not fictionalized. There's evidence of that in the record. And you put that right into the story. And you get to see Izzy as a young teenage girl witness that and how Enid navigates that. <laughs> yes. It, she just has to figure out a way to work with him. Again, there's some timeless elements to that. <laughs> yeah, it's, I think she, to her credit, she did, she wrote very flattering letters, I guess you would say, to him trying to tell him she would work with him shoulder to shoulder and that kind of thing. But it must have been a, a blow to her, to her ego too, just to have this person she had taught, you know, reprimanding her and scolding her and... <laughs> Belittling her in some ways, yeah, and not taking her seriously, right? questioning her qualifications at every turn. Yeah. Yeah, it was hard for her to have respect in the workplace, which also just, again, it kind of felt timeless to me. I loved hearing that you found that through research, that that wasn't just something you imagined was happening, that that actually is documented. Right. And other articles, too, besides this book that I have found have documented that she did have to struggle. So it, it's documented in several Yosemite archives and other articles that have drawn upon Enid Michael as a, in the backpacker.com, things like that, too. Yeah. So she and her husband, were they actual climbers as well? Like we know that she was involved in the wildflower garden and that she had this role every summer in the park but was she actually an accomplished climber the way you write about her she really was she truly was and it's uh, incredible to think that she, they didn't use ropes she and her husband their descriptions when she's writing articles to the Yosemite nature notes of her going on these hikes where she and climbs just finding these footholds and yeah it, just breathtaking to think that there were 
times too that she hiked or climbed alone without her husband or a partner. And and to think about it in terms of that time frame, you know, almost a hundred years ago, say that anyone had the courage and the gumption and the will, like it also speaks to a little bit to the majesty of that place. Yeah. That still today, there are people that look at it and go, I want to climb. <laughs> I want to get up there. You know, it inspires people to go higher, to see more. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. She really was a pioneer of, of her time. And that, as far as the climbing and hiking went, you also included another famous, very famous Ansel Adams. Yes. I know maybe he was there in the same time frame, but did he actually also interact with? Yes, they did. And I, I discovered that also through an article that she had written where she names Ansel Adams and Virginia Adams as having accompanied her on this. On, it was actually the same hike up to Mount Watkins. Yeah, they were apparently very good friends, and Virginia Adams had lived in Yosemite almost all her life and had hiked with them even before she met her husband, Ansel, and they were all part of the Sierra Club, so they they went on hikes regularly with the Sierra Club, too. It's fascinating to think about because his imagery, the, the images that he's captured are the iconic pictures still today. Yes. And of Half Dome in particular. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's pause right here and listen to a scene from the audiobook. You're going to hear Izzy's first real hike. She's with Enid and Ansel and Virginia Adams. This is from The View from Half Dome, written by Jill Cogarty, published by Black Rose Writing, narrated by me. A massive, polished granite formation rose from the opposite bank. Isabel felt a hitch in her chest. This close, it resembled a medieval stone castle. She thought of James and the CCC crew assigned to rebuild the stairway for hikers. A thin patch of snow glistened on its crest. As Enid grabbed the rucksack from the back seat, Ansel slung the heavy camera bag and a smaller pack over his back and positioned a long wooden tripod over his shoulder. Enid shaded her eyes at the lake. I promised Charlie I'd find some interesting birds. And lo and behold, there's a great blue heron on the opposite shore. She maneuvered nimbly over a series of large rocks to reach the bank. Isabel took a few steps closer. To her astonishment, the heron glided into the air with a graceful, leisurely beat, long neck and wings outspread, spindly legs extended behind. Enid hustled to the woods at the edge of the lake and beckoned them over. The bee is not afraid of me. I know the butterfly. The pretty people in the woods receive me cordially. The brooks laugh louder. A poem? Virginia asked. Isabel met Enid's eyes and smiled. Emily Dickinson. They trekked through a dense forest of black oaks and arrived at a trail, mostly bare of trees, that zigzagged in a steep incline up the granite cliff of Mount Watkins. It's the beginning of the ascent, Enid said. We'll go slowly, if you like. No need to rush when you're not used to the altitude or climb. After a few paces along the switchback, Isabel panted, her face and throat roasting in the heat. A dozen yards ahead, Ansel and Virginia stepped briskly, disappearing around a bend, and Isabel was impressed that even laden down with heavy equipment, Ansel could easily outpace her. She realized with a stitch of guilt that Enid had hung back out of consideration. Stop here a minute, Enid said. In the pin of the path... She unfastened her pack and handed Isabel the canteen. As Isabel sipped, trying not to gulp, Enid pointed out wild lilacs. The sun was blazing onto the trail in full force. It's usually a hot trek. That's why we wanted to get an early start. Let's keep going, then. Isabel returned the canteen. There's no hurry. But it'll only get hotter the longer we stay here. 
Besides, the Adams will wonder where we are. They'll wait. I don't want to slow them down. But as they continued, and sweat dripped down Isabel's throat and chest, she regretted not having drunk more water. At the next switchback, Ansel and Virginia rose together from the shade of a lone oak. Virginia clucked in sympathy as she ran her eyes across Isabel's flushed face. Come to the shade, she ordered, steering Isabel by the shoulder to the spot she had vacated. Enid took a swig from the canteen before thrusting it into Isabel's hands. Ansel said, Mind if I walk ahead and find some pictures? Although the Stetson shielded his face and he had rolled up his shirt sleeves and pant legs, beads of moisture glistened on his arms and throat. Still, his eyes flared like a child's at a carnival. Go, Virginia waved him on. Isabel was thankful for the shade and a passing cloud while she caught her breath and sipped water. When they resumed the climb, Enid adjusted to a more leisurely pace, and Virginia lagged behind with them. Enid gives personality to not just wildlife, but also plants. She finds characteristics um, in common with plants. And one of the ones I really loved reading about becomes important to Izzy's story. So can you talk a little bit about that, like how you honed in on that particular flower and what its importance was? Sure, yes. So I know that lupine was one of the flowers that was in the wildflower garden years ago. And and by the way, the, the wildflower garden, it's no longer around at Yosemite. I think, unfortunately, it was it wasn't maintained. But at the time that she was there, there was a description of the flowers that were in the garden. Lupine was one of them. And when I started reading a little bit more about some of these plants, I found that lupine also blooms in the summer. It's kind of at its peak. And I read that it's hardy, it's resilient, it's kind of stands for creativity, imagination. And I thought, you know, this would be a nice symbolism of Enid's sort of teaching to Izzy about being strong, using her inner strength, finding courage within herself. I like that this is a story that, hey, here's a woman doing this. Here's an example of someone who found her way on this path. And it's nice to, to think about people that forged those paths that made that happen for themselves. I love that about this story. Oh, thanks. Is there anything that I that I haven't asked you about? I think you've covered a lot. I guess I would say that along the lines of of women having a, a difficult time, the ranger school where Enid taught, the Yosemite School for Rangers, it was very difficult even for women and only maybe 10% of the class who was admitted were women. Almost none of them was granted a, a slot as a ranger even after completing that program back in the 30s. So it, there were many barriers for women, and which is another reason why Enid Michael herself was so impressive. She was very persistent in, you know, showing her knowledge of the thousands of plants that she had documented and persuading her, the chief superintendent, um, that she was the right person for the job. Convincing people around her that she was worthy of it. Like, I think in the book you have the Adams, Ansel Adams writes a letter on her behalf. Yes, yes. Yeah, and you're right in pointing out that even though a hundred years almost have passed, um, it's it's not perfect <laughs> still for women today. But I I think that that is uh, another reason for stories like this to keep being told too. I, I don't know. I I appreciate history told in this manner. I like that you have taken a very historical, truthful kernel. You've, you've taken a lot of care with the real parts of this. Oh, thank you. Yes, I, I, the research, I mean, it was just fascinating to do the research for this, I have to say. It was fun. Did it lead you to anything else? So you said your first book, which was more of familial ancestry history, led you to this. Where has this led you? You know, for the third one, what I'm working on now is contemporary. So it's um, based on a fictional tech startup. So I think 
if I go back to history, it won't be to the depression. It might be to the eighties, which is, some people wouldn't say that's very historic <laughs> fiction at this point. Do you have a background in tech? Is that also part of who you are? Yeah, I, I worked in the tech industry for almost 30 years. I was, a, I started out as a software developer and then moved into product management and marketing. And, and when you mentioned fields where, you know, it's not always equal for men and women, that's definitely. <laughs> yeah, there's just not, there's still just not equal representation. No, unfortunately. Um, and I think there's a culture of a lot of the people, a lot of these men in power hiring others like themselves and not really being aware that they're doing it. They'll say it's meritocracy, yet really they're not seeing that they themselves rose to where they were in part because of their own connections. And it's sad, but true. It's, yeah, that's what this book is kind of going to kind of do is expose some of that sort of the sexism, classism, uh, ageism in that history. Yeah, that's almost the definition of systemic, right? What you were just saying about like the person in power who's hiring is hiring other people like him. Right. And he rose because he knew people like him above him. And that repeating pattern is what we mean by something systemically not working, systemically broken. Yeah. Well, I look forward to reading it. So I the, usually the last question I like to ask has to do with the, the name of the podcast, which for me came from a poem called Desiderata that was things that you should feel are important, things that you should value as important. So I like to ask authors for you, if you had to explain to somebody what's essential, um, what do you say? I think in my case, um, for me, it's it's really being true to who I am. And for years, when I was working in that tech industry, I really, I don't think I was really doing what I loved. I, I know I wasn't doing what I loved. Um, have a passion for creative writing. And that has just opened everything up for me that's been, you know, made made my life more meaningful just to pursue this passion. Giving yourself the permission to pursue something that is meaningful for you and and really pursue it, you know, despite the barriers that you need to overcome to go after it. To me, that's that's essential. Yes, and that is so hard. Isn't it? it is. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you're right. It is. It's, it's, um, I do, I do feel fortunate that I can now write full time. I kind of had a period of time where, you know, I, I thought about it. I wanted to do it, but fortunately after speaking, you know, talking with my husband, talking, making some changes now, that's what I do full time. So I do feel very fortunate that I can, can do that. Yes. And that is so hard, technically, as in shaping your life around what that means um, in the marketplace, hard that way, but also hard in the way of finding what that is for you. Yeah. Knowing what that is. Like, did you always know you wanted to be a writer? When I was six years old, my parents asked me the question and I said, I want to be a writer. And the, the, their response was, no, you, you shouldn't, you, that doesn't pay well. And so I had never really gave, I mean, I, I was kind of this dutiful daughter who tried to please my parents for many years, but I never gave that up. And I, I now tell my own daughter, she's a freshman in high school, you need to find a job that you love. It doesn't matter what it pays. Don't worry about that. Just be passionate about it. Do something that you're going to, because you'll be working on this job, you know, 40 plus hours a week for 30 plus years. It's interesting what we encourage and discourage people from, you know, that as valuable as a storyteller is in a community, we actually don't encourage that in children. No. And yet all of the value that is in that creative space for learning how to interact, for showing us places where two things can coexist, right? Like you have two truths in this story about the poverty of San Francisco and the beauty of like that comes through 
research and story. Yeah, you're right. It's and I think just stories and audiobooks, all of that are timeless too. I mean, during the pandemic, during the depression, it's a way for people to find some solace from <laughs> what's you know what was happening at the time. I hope you enjoyed getting to know Jill as much as I did. I put her website in the show notes, as well as a link to purchase the audiobook for The View from Half Dome. When you enjoy a book in any format, please leave a review. Reviews actively help with marketing and, you know, they just improve visibility and sales overall. Plus, it's just nice. As always, thanks for being here and thanks for listening.